There's something that I love about this community, and that's how willing everybody is to help everybody out. The only thing that I've noticed is that some of us old folks seem to be using a different language from some of the newcomers into this industry. And so this video, what I'd like to do is go over all the terminology as much as I can to help all you younglings to understand what it is we're saying when we're trying to help you. So we use a lot of different terminology within the space. So I'm gonna make this into three separate videos instead of one that's gonna be way too long and you're gonna get bored and stop watching long before it's over. The three videos is gonna be broken into three major topics. The first topic is going to be about the, the physical 3D printer itself. The second one's gonna be general terminology around resin 3D printing. And the third one's gonna be more of the software side or the logical side being the slicer, the 3D files and whatnot. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is like this video, subscribe to the Let's YouTube channel and hit that notification bell so when I'm done making the next two videos and I put them up, well, you'll be notified that I'm done and you will all be able to be on the same page with all the different terminology I'm gonna cover in these three videos. And like I said, it's, it's a lot. It's gonna take me a bit of recording to get them all done. So now I wanna cover the types of printers. Now, we're only gonna be covering one of these in this list, but let's just cover them first. First, we have FDM, which stands for Fuse Deposition Modeling aka filament printers, which is the kind that just poops out plastic. Next one is DLP, which stands for digital light processing. That's using the little mirrors to kind of reflect the UV light in different patterns that's going to cure the resin and create your model. Not the one we're covering in this video, but close. The next one is SLA, which stands for a big word I'm not gonna to try to pronounce, which is basically using a laser to cure the resin in a vat, somewhat similar to the one we're gonna be talking about, but again, a little bit off. Then there's SLS, which stands for Selective Laser Stingering, uh, which basically is using a laser to cure a bunch of powder. Pretty awesome, has some really unique applications, but again, not in context for this video. The one we're gonna be covering in this video is MSLA, which stands for Masked Stereography Apparatus. Uh, say that really quickly. Uh, but the important thing is that that M stands for mass, and that's the type of printer we're gonna be covering in this video. So here in the MSLA 3D printing space, we really have two things we need to consider. Any cubic and not any cubic. What I mean by that is whether it's an Elgu, Frozen, Crality, or many other brands, they're gonna be using a motherboard that's down here made by Chichu Systems, which also makes Chichu Box. Same company, just different departments. On the other side, you've got any cubic that makes their own software and their own motherboards, so basically any cubic or not any cubic. So now let's go top to bottom on these printers and just kind of talk about the different components and the terminology we use to describe them. The first one is the hood. There's many different types of hoods. This one comes off, it's solid, and many colors. Some hoods uh, go over, some hoods open up, some hoods pop off like this all the way. It's all just the hood. The next key feature here is the build plate. Now there's kind of two different types of build plates nowadays. There's ones which are manually leveling build plates, which is like this one. You see the two bolts on either side. You loosen these bolts, you manually level the build plate. Then there's the other type of build plates, which are, you could call them no leveling build plates. That would be like the some of the new Elegoo ones where they've got these spring systems. If I push on that, you could probably see that screw move. There's springs inside of here that are always free floating, so this thing can always move up and down during the entire print. Whether you think that's a good idea or not is, you know, not the point of this video, but this is what we call essentially a self-leveling build plate or a non-leveling build plate. But the important bit to note is that this is the build plate right here. So whenever we talk about that, that's a terminology. In the software, this is also called the floor. So when you're talking about things reaching the floor, what we're really talking about is the build plate. The build plate and floor, as weird as that might sound, are the same thing. The next component is the build arm. Now the build arm is what comes out from the build tower and it's what the build plate attaches to. This one right here has got a force sensor built into it. Most of the newer ones do, but just know that this little part right here is the build arm. And moving on from the build arms, we've got the build tower. Now the build tower has got a couple components. So we'll start again, maybe from the outside and work our way in since the top to bottom doesn't make sense. So starting from the outside here, this one is what we call a dual, a dual linear rail system. You can see there's two rails right here, the shiny bits. And this one is a singular rail system. It can probably be hard to see in the camera, but there's only one rail behind it. And then as we move in, we've got the screw right here. These are what we call T screws. And it's the, the T is the type of grooving that's basically been uh, grooved into the screw itself. There's another type called a ball bearing screw. Let me show you what that looks like. For short, you could also call it a ball screw, but pretty much what this is, is there's ball bearings inside this housing here. And you can see the grooves are much, much wider, much longer. That's for the ball bearings to kind of go around inside. There's pros and cons to each one of these ones. The pros of the ball screw is that they have, they can generally be much more accurate and much less wobble. The cons are they're much more expensive and they're also much harder to install properly. 
If installed improperly, it can cause binding and cause a lot of issues in your printer. So sometimes when a printer chooses to use one of these, if it's not QA properly installed properly, it's gonna cause a lot of problems. And in that situation, it would actually be better to have a T-screw as they're much easier to install and significantly cheaper. And the next thing to see is right here at the bottom. This is the limit switch. On this printer, it's at the bottom. On this one, it's at the top, kind of hidden and hard to see. The job of the limit switch is when this build plate goes down to home, this little piece of metal right here, it's going to intersect those two uh, pieces of that, for that sensor right there, and it's gonna stop this thing from moving anymore so it doesn't crash into your LCD. It's kind of like a garage door. This printer homes at the top, so it's kind of the same thing. It's gonna hit that switch, it's gonna prevent it from going up and crashing and basically busting out the top of the tower right there. And down here underneath it, you're not gonna be able to see on either one of these because it's hidden, there is a stepper motor. The stepper motor is of course what's controlling the spinning of the screw that's going to raise or lower that build arm with the build plate attached and that's what's gonna make the print, print. The next thing are the VAT screws. Now luckily these are metric and they're gonna be like M4 or M5 or M6. These little tiny ones are most likely M4. So if you ever need to get a replacement, and you wanna to go to the hardware store, just know that's what you're looking for. The next point of terminology is this drum thing right here. Now we're just gonna call this a release film. There are many different types of release film. This particular one that's rather opaque it's got a textured side on one side and a nice, soft, clear side on the other. This is what we call ACF. ACF comes in these flat sheets. They look like this. I've never seen them come in a roll like this. I've really only seen uh, PFA or what's also known as NFEP come in a roll. However, I have seen NFEP show up like this as well. So just know it may not be the best indicator how it shows up of what it is, but it should be clearly labeled. The other type or older type is just called FEP or FEP. In fact, I see a lot of people still refer to what I call a release film as FEP, despite the fact that there are so many types of release film now that I'm just gonna token it all as release film. Now, once we've gotten down to the LCDs, there's generally going to be two more components, the screen protector and then the LCD tape or the gasket. The screen protector comes in a few different options as well. There's a glass kind, which I don't have access to right now. Probably the best. The glass kind is generally slightly smaller than the LCD, so you can kind of see it as a little bump. There's then these hard, clear plastic type. This doesn't look very clear because it's got some protective covers on it. But these ones are actually quite clear, almost as clear as the glass. And they do a pretty good job. Generally, they're going to be slightly smaller than the LCD and also generally slightly smaller than the LCD tape or the gasket. The other type is like this one, where the gasket and the screen protector is built into one. There's some pros and cons. Of course, the pro is that it's a very smooth sheet and it's very flat, it's very easy to install. The con is, what I've noticed, is that the plastic here, because it's uh, a different type of plastic to be a single sheet, is generally, it scratches a little bit easier, it's a little bit more foggy, so it kinda hurts a little bit of the accuracy, but overall, not a bad design to incorporate into one. And then that's, as you can see right here, that's the gasket. In some, in most cases, the gasket is a separate piece. Like for example, on the Anycubic here, this gasket piece is one piece that you put on that will go over the LCD. However, the screen protector is actually slightly smaller than the gasket. So if I want to, I could pull off the screen protector right now and replace it without having to replace the gasket. On the Elegoo ones, I've seen it where it's kind of, I've seen it where it's both where the screen protector is actually underneath the gasket. So in order to place the screen protector, I'm replacing both the screen protector and the gasket. Now, once you've removed the gasket or the screen protector, there's one more layer on the LCD, and that is the polarizing film. Now, the polarizing film is very important. Without it, you're basically your LCD is toast. You're gonna have to replace it. In the early days, these things did not come with screen protectors and the polarizing film was very easy to damage through scratching it, trying to clean it off, you get a drip of resin on there, it eats into it, or just using IPA and cleaning it would scratch it and damage it. Many LCD had a very short lifespan due to this, but now in today's day and age, when you buy a 3D printer that's new, the odds of it not coming with a screen protector are incredibly low. And underneath all of that are the LCDs. Now every 3D printer has at least two LCDs. There's gonna be the front LCD and the top LCD. The front LCD is how you can control this printer and that's pretty much all it's used for. So if we ever tell you uh, when we're helping you, you have to do that on the printer, what we mean is you have to go onto this front LCD and do something here in order to manipulate this printer in a very particular way. The top LCD is where that M comes from, from the MSLA. That's the masking LCD where the pixels are gonna be either white to be active or black to be inactive, 
where the white is going to let UV light through to cure the resin and the black will not. Now there's two different types of LCDs you could potentially find in an MSLA printer. The M doesn't stand for monochrome, which is one of the types. The M stands for masking. The other type of LCD you might find in some of the older printers is an RBG, red, blue, green uh, screen. That LCD actually could do full color. The problem with that is it would actually block so much UV light from getting through that uh, basically a layer that could cure on one of these printers in maybe two seconds could take anywhere from like 15 to 20 seconds on the old types of screens. So if you have one of those types of printers, maybe it's time to upgrade. Sometimes they have an upgrade kit or you can buy these new printers for pretty cheap. It's definitely worth the upgrade. The next thing about these printers that can be a little bit confusing is the quality of the top LCD. This is a 14K printer and this is a 9K printer. So pretty much what that means is kind of nothing because this one's 10.1 inches LCD and this LCD is uh, seven inches. So how does the size of the printer and the resolution really matter? Uh, it kind of doesn't, which is why we take that whole K thing, we just kind of throw it out the window as it's not a very good way to determine which printer is actually better or you know has a higher resolution screen. So basically we're just gonna throw that K thing out the window entirely. And instead we're gonna reference these by the size of the pixel. Now this one right here, the largest pixel size it has is just over 24 UM. And on this one right here, it's 18 UM. Now remember, this is a 9K LCD and this is a 14K LCD. So this one has smaller pixels, more densely packed than this one does. So therefore this printer will give you a better accuracy. Now, although it is true, this one has rectangle pixels, so depending on which way you're measuring, one of them goes down to 16.8 UM. So depending on the way you're measuring it, this one could be better than that one. But I think for the sake of the accuracy you can actually get, I'm gonna go by the larger number instead of the smaller number, as I kind of think using uh, rectangle pixels is cheating. But anyway, that's kind of the terminology on that one. It's gonna be XY resolution, 18 UM, 24 UM. And that's how we're gonna describe these printers. And moving further down, the next thing we have is what I call the top plate. Now the top plate is this big chunk of aluminum here on the top, which is generally quite thick and sturdy. This one has one too, but it's underneath the plastic, so you can't see it, just a different design. But just know this right here is the top plate. And moving below the top plate, you've got the UV engine. Now the UV engine comes with a couple components, but there's two major types. There's the one with a cob, which is just a bundle of UV LEDs that will reflect off of some big reflector and then push that UV engine or that UV power out the LCD. Then there's like a matrix system, which has an array of UV lights that go through some sort of lens, like a Pell lens or a Pello lens or a Forenzel lens. I probably mispronounced that. And the way these work is generally a cob system is better, but it all depends on the way it's implemented. The different components of a UV engine are going to be the LED, the uh, basically the lens or the reflector, and then cooling units. The LEDs get very, very hot. If you don't have a good cooling unit, they're gonna burn out and die. Also, the LCD can get very, very hot. If it doesn't have a good cooling unit, it can burn out and die. So all those components together are what we call the lighting engine. And a good lighting engine can make or break a printer despite the fact if it's got a good or high quality LCD or tower or anything. It's kind of one of those key components we wanna make sure we're looking out for. But anyway, that's the terminology for this one, lighting engine. So if you own a resin 3D printer, there's two things that you really need to know how to do. The first one is a dry print and the second one is an LCD exposure test. So first, let's talk about what a dry print is. A dry print is where we're gonna tell the printer to do a print, but dry, meaning without resin. To do this, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is remove the build plate. We wanna take this off first because we're gonna pretend it's covered in resin. Of course, if it was, I'd be using gloves. And then you're gonna set it aside where it's not going to get anything dirty. The next thing you're gonna do is remove the vat. Again, we're gonna pretend the vat is full of resin. So make sure you put this somewhere where the bottom of it isn't gonna get dirty. So when you put it back on your LCD, you don't destroy your LCD. So now that we've removed the build plate and the vat, we're gonna take a clean piece of paper and cover up the LCD. We're doing this for two reasons. One, so I'm not looking directly at UV light, burning my eyes. And two, it's just a lot easier to see what's going on through a piece of paper than it would be burning my eyes. With the paper here, we're now going to start a print either off the USB or off the internal storage. This way we're going to simulate a print without resin so we can just see what's going on, hence the term dry print. I'm gonna turn off the light so it's a little bit dark so you can kind of see, you probably see that there's three bars right here. There's actually supposed to be five squares, not three big bars. 
So doing a dry print, I was able to very quickly identify that there's something definitely wrong with this LCD. And if I print other things, I'll see the same bars. This let me very quickly understand that this LCD is damaged and I need to get a replacement. The other type of system is what we call an LCD exposure test, which is very different from a dry print. No, when we do a dry print, we really want the printer to read that sliced file from the internal storage or the USB drive and actually try to print it. There's a lot more being tested there. With an, L with an LCD test, we're just testing whether or not the LCD is going to go transparent and the UV light engine is going to work. Generally, you'll find that under settings. And here it's just called uh, screen exposure test. And depending on the manufacturer, there's going to be some different patterns. But generally, the one I run is just the full screen. Just hit full screen. Um, and it's going to go and turn on the entire exposure test. And unfortunately, this printer was damaged in the mail. I ran the dry print before I even put resin in it, allowing me to identify that the screen, well, didn't make it through transit. I was able to contact Elgu and they've already sent me a new screen. I just need to replace it and this thing will be good to go. It's dark again so you can see this, but here's an example of how the exposure test is very different than the dry print. Here I can see that these four, these three bands here, which were the only things that actually turned on when I did the dry print, are now the things that are actually not activating when I'm doing the exposure test. I can also see there's all these black dots everywhere. Uh, yeah, something very bad happened to this LCD in transit or shipping or in the factory. I'm not exactly sure what happened, but this, this LCD here has seen better days and definitely needs to be replaced. In summary, the dry print is where we're doing a print without the vat and without the bill plate, basically no resin, a dry print. We're doing this because we're testing multiple things from the quality of the slice, to the UV light engine, to the LCD, to the printer's ability to just do anything. Versus the exposure test, where the only thing we're testing there is whether or not the UV light engine is turning on and the LCD pixels are activating or deactivating properly. And here's a pro tip for you about the power brick. Now, some printers come with power bricks and some of them just come with the regular cable right here that just plugs right into the back and you don't need a power brick. However, if you end up getting a lot of printers, you're gonna end up with a lot of power bricks and they're not all the same. So make sure you label them right when you get them. Doing this would prevent me from using the power bricks for my M3 Premium or my M5S on my Mars 5 Ultra and potentially killing it, which would be a rather bad day. I think that sums up the terminology of the printers themselves. If I missed anything or said anything wrong, let me know in the comments down below. If you're a new user, you probably wanna read the comments down below to make sure I didn't miss anything or say something wrong. While you're there, please like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And if you haven't already, join us on the Lygie Slicer Discord. And as always, thank you for watching and have a good day.